So Adnan, thanks for coming on. Um, so for anyone just listening and uh, doesn't know your story, give us a bit of a background about Car Throttle, uh, how you got started and you know how you started on this journey. Yeah, sure. So um, I started Car Throttle actually from my university bedroom back in 2009, long time ago now, 10 years. And um, prior to that, I had a blog uh, when I was 16 years old. And that blog was um, basically me learning about the internet, how to generate traffic, how to sell advertising, uh, and it was called Blogtrepreneur. And I ran that for two years, and just before my 18th birthday, uh, I sold that to an American uh, media company. But I'd always had this big passion for cars. I think I'm not alone in, in thinking that most young boys my age would sit down on a Sunday night and watch Top Gear every Sunday night. And at that time, 2009, there wasn't really much on online. You had a couple of videos here and there. People like Top Gear were recutting TV content and putting it on YouTube, but there was nothing really for uh, this new social millennial generation. So the idea was, can we build a Top Gear for the Facebook generation? And that was how Car Throttle got started. Nice. And I think um, one of the things that I definitely struggled with at the beginning, you know, when, uh, when we made the kind of leap from being a student to trying to run our own business was, I think when I when I left uni, kind of all my friends ended up getting jobs. Uh, they were immediately, you know, earning more money than uh, you know the sport of you had made in total. Um, I guess uh, you know how, how did you how did you personally deal with that kind of um, you know I guess it, for me anyway it was definitely an insecurity about oh god what am I doing this is not going to work but you know uh, how did you deal with getting past that stage of things. It, was, it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> I think a lot of the early traction helped to take away some of those nerves associated with running a business. I think I've said this a couple of times, but my, my, my mum was always a bit skeptical of me going into business straight away without having actually worked for anyone before. And I never had a job and I still have never technically worked for someone and had a job. Um, but when we started to get more recognition, we would get some press cards coming through. So the first one I got was a, a Mitsubishi Colt Rally Art. And it was a 1.5 litre turbo hot hatch or warm hatch, it wasn't actually that hot. And um, I think people started to, to realize, or at least on my personal Facebook, that this wasn't like a joke project that I just decided to bum around at home for a year because, oh, a big manufacturer was suddenly sending us a car to review. So it just legitimized it a bit more. And um, I always said to myself, look, it kind of doesn't matter what people think. And I've tried to stick with that for as long as possible because realistically, what people say and what people think should have, shouldn't have a bearing on what you do. Um, most of the time, it's, it's just about how you feel about a particular business. And so getting that legitimacy through seeing the growth and there was growth in the early days quite quickly and that definitely helped. First video that we did with Volvo got over 100,000 views. Those little indicators certainly helped to to make me realise that this was actually something that could work. Sure, and t you guys obviously have a, a big um, social following. Um, I, I would say, you know, your Facebook page and the growth of it was obviously a big part of your business back then. What, um, what, how, how did that happen? Was that kind of just uh, by chance, or what, what happened? Uh, so we um, we started off with the blog, WordPress, really simple, and a YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel, it, it, it struggled to get traction. We tried a lot of different types of content, some of which you might have seen in the early days, some, some weird stuff. <laughs> um, music videos, rap, rap videos about cars, some strange role play videos um, that we had to remove from YouTube for just violating everyone's human rights. <laughs> and um, the, the, what, what changed was we were trying to get traffic to these YouTube videos and we were experimenting with all kinds of you know, traffic sources, trying to rank on Google for certain keywords. And at that time, Facebook was just starting to take off, or at least it was gaining traction with pages, whereas before it was all personal accounts. And Alex, who's our now head of video, contacted this Facebook page called Car Memes. And uh, the guy from Car Memes basically said, well, if you pay me, I think it was like five pounds for a link, um, <laughs> I'll post a link to one of your car throttle articles on the page. First link got posted and I think it got something like 10,000 concurrent users. It was, it was something ridiculously high and it just crashed our shared server, which obviously just wasn't capable of holding any form of traffic whatsoever. And then we were like, well, hold on a second. So we, we paid for another link. Same thing happened again, took the site out. And we were like, 
uh, there's something here. Let's let's do regular linking from Facebook. And every time we would link from Facebook, we'd get this massive spike in traffic. And it became clear that Facebook was a necessary part of our strategy. But to kickstart it, we decided to acquire that page, Car Memes. And the founder of that page, Gabor, um, was a student again in Bristol. And we said, cool, let's um, acquire the page. You will have a full-time job after uni and you can spearhead our marketing. And he did that and he was kind of responsible for that very early doors Facebook growth. And we went from 100,000 fans to a million fans in a couple of months. It was, it was, I hadn't seen a time like it before. It was the early, the kind of West Cowboy Western days of Facebook where you could grow a page really, really quickly without any ad spend. And, uh, you know, what, I guess social media is a huge part of your business as a whole mm -hmm. and and I guess on a personal level as well but what um, you know it's obviously got its pros and cons uh, what are your general feelings about it as a, a thing it's a really good question I, I'm I'm conflicted I think is the right way to put it on one hand I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the power of those platforms the rise of Facebook and Instagram has created a whole new generation of, 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 of businesses that have thrived off this platform. That's great. Obviously there's a communication element there, which is also great, you know, being able to maintain contact with people you probably wouldn't have maintained contact with otherwise. The, the guilt that I feel is that we've helped to basically create addictions. All of these young car fans, and obviously we're not alone, media itself is complicit in this. We've helped to, um, decrease their attention spans. We're helping them to press refresh on an Instagram feed. We might be helping them lead to a lesser sense of self-worth because of all of these nice flashy supercar images that we post of us going, look how great our lives are. And I think that's my general feeling of social media, which is it's all very vapid. Everything is quite self-obsessed. And from a business point of view, that's amazing because it builds your influence and you're growing and you can build an audience of people that want to follow you. But on a deeper level, I do think that this is giving rise to this whole new generation of people with mental health issues, people with anxiety, people with self-doubt. And I don't see that going away unless the platform themselves change and how people use those platforms change, which in the case of Instagram is just not gonna change. That platform is all about showing off in its core form. Um, so I'm conflicted. I, I, I don't know what the solution is. Platforms like Snapchat, I think could have been a good solution had they not got killed off by Instagram stories and Facebook. Um, but yeah, it's it's a blessing and a curse. So how do you kind of reconcile that, that kind of, how do you balance that yourself on a daily basis? Because I guess it is, like you say, a kind of conflict, a conflict, you know? I, I think for us, we have to boil it back down to what is it that we're providing people. And actually, when you go right the way down, you provide them with happiness. Because what we do is we entertain people. Every day, they can come onto our social media feeds and see a piece of funny, cool, informative content. They can go away and laugh or they can share that piece of content with someone else so they're gaining more knowledge. So at its core, we're helping people, you know, lighten up during the day or on a Friday evening when we release a YouTube video, they can watch along with Alex, our host, have a laugh at the random things that he's got up to that week and feel good about themselves. And actually that's how I reconcile it because then we get emails and messages from our users who we call citizens. And they say to us, well, actually, you really helped me. In my life, I was going through something quite difficult. I was going through a struggle and I was able to log on to Car Throttle or go on the YouTube channel and actually find out and enjoy myself and have fun. And I was able to take my mind away from it. So thank you, Car Throttle, because you helped, you know, you helped me in a difficult time. And those are the things that we really live for. Yeah, for sure. I think um, my journey personally with, with the Sport Review and our, our main business, we've... Um, you know, been through plenty of ups and downs. Like the, the business has almost changed uh, unrecognizably from what it was at the beginning. Um, what, um, you know, what's the kind of key thing you've learned along your journey about growing a business from scratch? Oh, so many, so many <laughs> lessons learned. Really the first thing is that good things come to those who wait. I know that's slightly cliche, but as many people describe Creating and running a business is a, is a very extreme roller coaster. The highs are very, very high. For example, you close a big deal, you 
meet someone amazing you and, and we've had some really cool ones you know we get we got to go on the gumball 3000 we drove alongside lewis hamilton we've been to 10 downing street we've uh, worked with brands like mercedes benz or red bull or nissan or these these class brands that you know we always looked up to and thought oh wow imagine being able to work with them and we did it the lows are very low you know i've said this before but back in 2016 we had to pivot the business and it meant that I had to make half the team redundant and trying to, you know, deal with getting rid of 11, 12 of your friends, really, because at that point you work so closely with them that they're your friends and their family. It's difficult going through a fundraise that doesn't quite, you know, you can't quite pull it off. It's difficult. Um, not having a product that really hits the point is difficult. Having a video that flops is difficult. But so, but if you look at it kind of as a, as a long term horizon, the longer that you're in the game, the more success that you have and the more opportunities that you have to win. Um, and the people that quit first are the people that will never see that upside. The people that progressively slog it out for a good cause and with the right mission and with the right growth potential, things come your way, things land into your lap, but you have to work hard. This is a very difficult business. Running any business is hard. For people that think it's an easy ride and you'll know you'll, they'll make a film about you, like the social network, it's just not gonna happen. Every single founder that I know has been through the struggle and the struggle is real. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think also one of the things that I've kind of taken uh, or kind of realized over the last few years is that when you're running your own business as well, you're kind of in it, you know, you're in it on a daily basis. And sometimes you're always so focused on what's next, you know, what's the next goal, what's the next milestone, we need to do this. That sometimes you don't actually have that kind of grounding in the present and to actually appreciate and almost, you know, sometimes actually look back at what you've built um, so, you know, how, how important to you is it to, you know, every now and then, you know, s take a step back and take stock of what you've built? I find that difficult, personally. <laughs> I think I'm so geared towards looking to the future that most of the time I don't stop to look at what we've achieved. Again, I, I changed my mind about this mentality. On one hand, it's not healthy. Um, but I found that, you know, I've been using a lot of apps, Headspace, Calm, they help to ground me again read a lot um, but I feel like if I lost that drive that motivator of I need to do something next that possibly I wouldn't be as successful I wouldn't be as good I wouldn't feel like I'm working towards a mission so I think over over the last couple of years I've managed to strike this healthy balance between looking ahead but removing that expectations and reality gap because I'm sure it was the same with you but when you first started, you have these kind of delusions of grandeur that in two years time, you know, you're going to be as wealthy as Mark Zuckerberg and your companies are going to be on Forbes. And, you know, you're going to be like 25 under 25 top list every single day. And when that doesn't quite happen, because it only happens to a handful of people in our generation, you start to create this like reality versus expectations gap, which contributes to like your unhappiness. If you remove the expectation, but you still have this healthy drive towards wanting to achieve, suddenly anything you do is great because there's no benchmarks to compare it to. And that's what I've actually managed to do over the last couple of years is to remove that expectation uh, peg. Sure, and um, I, I agree fully. I think uh, it's definitely you know, having unrealistic expectations, but also being able to manage uh, that balance between you know, what, what, what's realistic to achieve and what you can achieve. But like you say, you know, if you're in the present moment and utterly content, then where's the drive to, to you know, go for more? So it's that kind of balance. It's always, always fascinated me, you know, mm -hmm. what actually, what's, what's the driving force behind things. So I was, I was talking to Gabor um, earlier, just briefly about, um, you guys have set up a, uh, like an e-commerce side of the site and that's mm -hmm. doing quite well. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about that? Definitely. So obviously car enthusiasts, they spend a lot of money on their cars um, and prior to a year and a half ago, we hadn't really monetized that community of users that were in market. We had t-shirts, we had merchandise, we had apparel, but nev never anything more than that. So we decided to see what we could do. Uh, and it's, it was as simple as Gabs and team buying some things from China, keychains famously, and um, selling them to our community. And from keychains, it became cleaning products. From cleaning products, it became um, car gadgets. From car gadgets, it actually became car parts. So now if you go to the car throttle shop, we have three shops, UK, US, rest of the world, and we have around 60,000 SKUs, 
Uh, and these are products all the way from brake kits to turbo kits to suspension um, to wheels um, to sticky track tires. So really, if you wanted to modify your car, you could purchase pretty much anything you needed through the car, th car throttle shop. On top of the gifts that we have for petrol heads, which are very popular, you know, Christmas time, Valentine's, all that kind of stuff. And um, what is, uh, this is a question I'm asking everyone I'm interviewing. Um, so yeah, so essentially it is, if you could go back knowing what you know now, what's the main piece of advice you'd give to your 18 year old self? Ooh. That is a tough one. I think a couple of things. Firstly, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot easier life options than doing this. I think it's the biggest piece of advice I would actually give is whatever happens, happens. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to achieve because all it does is contribute to you wanting more. Try and enjoy the journey. I think that's that's kind of a car cliche as well. But as you said earlier, we we've hit so many milestones in the life of this business. And I'd like to think that I've enjoyed nearly all of them. But there were definitely some times that we just rushed through to the next target. You know, half a million YouTube subscribers, a million YouTube subscribers, two million Facebook fans. After a while, the numbers are just numbers and they just keep rolling on and on and on. And we try to have a healthy balance in the team of celebration, but it's also just the personal growth. To take some time to, to, to celebrate how far we've all come as people within the team. Um, we have a great working relationship. We have you know regular company socials and that's actually the main part that I love, which is, Make sure that you're always working with people that you like. Life's too short to work with dickheads, basically, <laughs> and you should never have to work with them. So don't waste your time with people that you're not surrounding yourself with that make you happy. And I think that's the one thing I'm really grateful for at Car Throttle. Everyone in the team, we have a good laugh. Every day there's laughter. And I wouldn't have it any other way because that's what makes coming into work and being in this world 24 seven so enjoyable. So I'd say, yeah, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Enjoy the ride and enjoy the journey. Sure, and I guess it ties into that question as well. But um, it seems like being an entrepreneur these days is kind of like in vogue. People, want, you know, going down this route, it seems to be popular. People are, you know, people like Gary Vaynerchuk or, you know, huge followings on social media. But it seems like a lot of people don't kind of, um, uh, they like the the way it looks, but I don't, you know they might not be prepared for the reality of mm -hmm. of what it's like. Um, is that do you, do you agree with that? Do you think like you know it's something to think about? You know, not everyone's cut out to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I I think it's it can be glamorized. Well, actually, what I quite like about Gary Vee is that he literally says that you have to eat shit yeah, true. <laughs> regularly. So I feel like he tells it how it is. But you're right. Most of those success stories you see in the newspaper. Um, we've been there, right? We've been that nice double spread page in the evening standard. But you see that and you don't know all of the other BS that has happened around to get to that point. And actually, I think it was last year we had three pieces of press kind of weekly back to back. It was like the Times and it was evening standard and then it was something else. And I had people kind of coming up to me, friends and family going, oh, I can't believe it. Like you've made it like, you know, it seems like you've just gone from zero to nothing, like at zero to something, all in the space of three weeks. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. I was like, this doesn't feel any different than how it was. All you've seen is just like a snapshot over what's happened in the last seven years. Press is, from an external perception, entrepreneurship is sexy. It's glamorous because you only ever show the cool sides of entrepreneurship. What I think is happening more and more now is that entrepreneurs aren't as afraid to be vulnerable. They're not so afraid of going, oh, that VC might not give me that money anymore because everyone in the ecosystem has become a lot more acutely aware of, of just how difficult it is. So I agree on the whole. I think entrepreneurship is glamorized. I think it's changing. I'm glad it's changing. And I think we shouldn't be afraid of talking about our, our fuck ups and failures because those are what made us at the end of the day. And actually without those, you know, you stop learning and that's it, it's over. You should always be learning, you should always be making mistakes and not being afraid of fucking up. And actually that's another piece of advice I'd give to my 18 year old self is make as many mistakes as you possibly can because that's what separates you from the not so good ones that are too scared to make a mistake. Sure, I think, I, I agree. I think that, um, 
you know, the press coverage, you know, the, the, the social media likes and the adoration you get and like people, people only see a small, it's like social media in general, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's a filtered version of life exactly. that, that is like not real. You don't see the, the hard work and the, the pain and the suffering and the, the lows that are behind it all. But yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a, um, well, it's a, it's a long journey and definitely mm -hmm. something that if you're, if you're wanting to be an entrepreneur, it's something to think about strongly because yeah. it's not it's not easy and it probably isn't cut out for everyone. But yeah. but yeah, it's uh, it's great. And so yeah, just wrapping things up. Where's the uh, where's the best place for people to to stay in touch with you and your your company and basically yeah, keep in touch. So Car Throttle is pretty much everywhere. <laughs> um, so YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, it's just Car Throttle, and then me personally. Instagram at nano R35 um, because of my R35 GTR car. Nice. So if people wonder why I've got some weird uh, letter and numbers after my name. Um, and that's, to be honest, I've, I, I kind of stopped using platforms like Twitter. I, f I found that there was just too much stuff I didn't care about on Twitter. Facebook as well, I aside from the business use, I don't use it as much personally. I've actually tried to wean myself off social media. Mm. I know it sounds a bit perverse given the business that I'm in. Yeah, but, interesting. Um, but from a business point of view, I still consume content regularly, but from a personal point of view, I've stopped broadcasting as much. Um, maybe it's a phase, maybe, I'm, I'm not sure. Was that a conscious thing or is it? It's just happened naturally. Yeah. I think I've just wanted to share less and have some more things to myself. Sure. I've lived life quite publicly up until now that I found it quite nice to just slightly withdraw and just people can't see what I'm up to. Because normally I'd post like 10 Instagram stories a day and some weeks I never post at all now. So I think I'm just enjoying this little quiet time. And we're, we're so busy in the business that actually it just, it's not even come into my head yet. So um, yeah, Instagram. <laughs> Instagram's the one. All yeah. right. Nice one. Thank you. Cheers, Martin. Cheers.